Welcome to Living Your Greatness. Each episode, we bring on great people to inspire you to achieve your greatness. We discuss topics all related to health and wellness. Listen to world-class stories, learn valuable lessons, and turn knowledge into action. It is now time for you to unlock your inner greatness. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy, And today we have a new guest to the show, and his name is Mike West. So for those of you that don't know Mike, he is a former backstroke swimmer from Canada who competed for his native country at the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, California. At that games, he won the silver medal in the men's four times 100 meter medley relay and the bronze medal in the 100 meter backstroke. His many qualities as both a swimmer and a person were recognized when he was named captain of the men's team. In 1995, Mike became part of the Ontario Aquatic Hall of Fame. So Mike, welcome to Living Your Greatness. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to taking a break from doctoring and homesteading to share some stories with you about my swimming career. Awesome, Mike. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to have you here because I actually met you a month ago mm-hmm. at the celebration of Clifford Berry's life, who was a coach that both Mike and I had. So Mike, let's actually get started here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you spend your formative years growing up? And what inspired you to become a world-class swimmer? I grew up in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, Southern Ontario town, and pretty sort of average growing up kind of experience, you know, did swimming lessons, uh, hated hockey. I hated putting hockey skates on. So that was a no-go for me. Uh, Tried a a few different sports growing up. wasn't overly coordinated, although I was tall and skinny. So that worked to my advantage for a few things. So I remember um, doing some track and field once in public school. uh, And I think I still, well, I had the Waterloo County grade seven or eight high jump record. So yeah, I tried high jumping and I liked, I liked running. um, But swimming was my, something that came easy to me. So I think that's what made it easier for me to pursue it. Um, Although, I mean, I liked it casually when I first started joining the uh, the KWY swim club in the mid 70s uh, so when I was about 12 or 13 I tried it I liked it a little bit but then came the morning workouts and I, I went on strike I was not going to do that I went to a few morning workouts and it was too early it was too stressful so my parents pulled me from the club for a year because I just found it too stressful uh, and then um, in 19 uh, I think uh, 76 or 77, I, 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 77, I think I joined in again, uh, and started getting into it. So when I was about 13 or 14, um, and it came, I think then I started committing more to it and training more. And I think because I had such success early on, that was a motivating factor for me to stay in the sport. I mean, I won, uh, in 79, what's called, it was division two, uh, kind of like our age group nationals, uh, again, no name in, in Montreal uh, at the uh, Claude Robillard pool, actually. Uh, so that was my first big meet in 79, I think. And then in 80, uh, I went to the Olympic trials again with it was now the region of Waterloo Swim Club. Paul Moronin was my coach. And uh, I remember I won the B final. So that was pretty huge for me because like the Olympic trials, I'm thinking like, well, this is, this is not going to happen in my lifetime, but going to the trials and winning the B final and then hopping out of the water and seeing some, some swimmers that I really looked up to like Steve Pickell and Wade Flemons, you know, hopping in the pool for their Olympic moment, trying to get on the Olympic team. That was, that was inspiring. Um, So that was kind of my introduction to swimming. So started out slow, hated the morning workouts, but then had quick success. And that was just something that just kept me moving forward with the sport. Awesome, Mike. Thanks for, you know, talking a bit about your formative years. I actually didn't know that you were also a runner or also involved in track. <laughs> so it's kind of cool to hear about, you know, other uh, athletics that you participated in. Um, and it was also cool to hear about the authenticity of who you are, right? Of of also, you know, uh, being human about how it wasn't always easy when you were younger there with those morning practices, because it does take a lot of discipline. But something that I do want to move to here, Mike, is, you know, eventually, you know, you had very, you know, important coaches in your life and, you know, you've already mentioned one of them. So how, how do you think these coaches were part of your experience of reaching a high performance level in swimming? I mean, coaches play such an essential role in athlete development and athlete motivation. 
I mean, I had some, I had some great coaches, you know, right from when I started out and then to, you know, Paul Moronin was my first coach sort of at a, at a national level. He was the coach of regional Waterloo swim club uh, until Cliff took over in 80. And, uh, you know, Paul, he brought a certain um, focus on skill development and, and really focused on the technique of my sport. He was, he ended up being Ann Ottenbright's coach. So he knew something about technique and sport and how to bring the most out of an athlete. So um, he, I remember doing backstroke drills with Paul and he was the first one that got me working on my head position. And he would get, a, I don't know if it was a water bottle or a cup of water and you place it on your forehead and you just go back and down the pool. And you know, if the pool, if the, if the bottle fell off your forehead, you gotta go back and start all over again. So really focused on, you know, perfect head position, rotation of the shoulders. Uh, and yeah, he was, he really did focus on the technique of the sport. So I was, I certainly benefited from having his, his um, input uh, and motivation early on. And then, then came along Cliff and well, what more, well, there's a lot more I could say about Cliff. He was uh, larger than life. The first time I met him, it was at the 80 Olympic trials after I did my back to hundred back, I think. He was in the stands between heats and finals, and he was coaching, I believe, at uh, Vancouver Dolphins. He was an assistant coach there, but he was going to come to Waterloo. Um, and Paul, Paul, my the coach at my time, introduced me to Cliff. And um, I remember listening to him, uh, his voice, like he, I thought he had a cold or something, but he had this really scratchy voice. And anyone who, who knew uh, Cliff knew his unique voice, kind of like Muttley, Dick Dasterly's canine sidekick, that <laughs> kind of sound and the, the scratchy voice and his laughter was infectious so I knew I was in good hands but man was he intimidating like he was he was kind of still off his water polo day so he was totally jacked like he had calf muscles on his calf muscles and I thought oh my god like this guy is gonna be a tough coach but then he did laugh and so I thought okay this this is good this is gonna work out okay um and I knew he was bringing in a, a bunch of other swimmers with him um, I'll be honest, I, I kind of knew the name Victor Davis, but I know he was also at the trials with me and he was swimming pretty well, but, um, and Alan, Alan Swanson and Kevin Odger and thought, okay, these, these are names I've heard of. They, this is, this is going to be a fun year. And little did I know how far that, uh, that team would go. Awesome, Mike. Thanks for, you know, talking about those experiences and, and those coaches. When you talked about your coach, Paul, there, who did the water cup on, on top of your head, it made me think of when I was a coach, how, how I had, had done that with my swimmers. And then also hearing about, you know, Cliff, he definitely does have a very interesting raspy voice and definitely was someone that had a, how do I say, like a, a strong presence, but really also at the same time is a very caring, authentic, kind human. So something that I want to move to, Mike, is I am aware that you were, you know, pretty thin and, and you also had long arms. That was kind of an advantage that you had for, you know, becoming a backstroker. So how did this give you a competitive edge over other swimmers? Well, having the long wingspan definitely helps with backstroke. I mean, just having long levers to move you through the water, um, but also getting to the wall first. I mean, it, you know, it's I didn't I mean, I have I'm tall. I was always tall and skinny. I never beefed up. I never could. But I had that long wingspan, not quite as big as uh, Michael Gross, uh, the, the albatross from Germany that had the massive wingspan that set world records in butterfly. But um, yeah, it, it worked to my advantage. And it, um, backstroke just came easier to me. I mean, that was just one stroke, I think, because of my long arms. I mean, I, I sucked at butterfly. I mean, my shoulders would get so sore. And my long arms, I just, I couldn't make them work to my advantage. So I was awful at butterfly. Breaststroke, meh. Freestyle, I could get by, but backstroke was the easiest stroke for me. And, and anyone who swims backstroke, the advantage is you've got, you don't have to turn your head to breathe. So you're, it's a lot easier to breathe when you're completely bagged and exhausted uh, on your back than it is turning your head when you're doing freestyle, or at least that was my belief. So uh, yeah, and it's, so it, the long arms help, you know, in a racing situation as well. So getting to the wall first clearly is, is what you want to do and uh, to, to win races. And I had a lot of close calls with races a lot you know where I had some really close touches I know um 83 at the university games in Edmonton um I was flanked by a Russian on either side of me in the 100 back final and uh, I out touched them won the gold by a tenth I think and they were like hundreds of seconds between second and third so it was a really close race but that that extra length in my arm helped me win that race and then in 84 winter nationals 
in Winnipeg, Sandy Goss and I were in the 200 back final and we both went under the world record. Well, it was called a world best at the time, but it was a world record. And so we, we were both under, but I outtouched him by, I think, by a tenth. So long arms do, do help with that final final stroke because you're always like diving for the wall. So having that extra arm length to be able to dive in just that much further. Yeah, I, I it, use it to its full advantage. Awesome, Mike. Yeah. And, and you know what? I'll, although there was, you know, a bit of a physical advantage there at the same time, it's not like that means all right. You obviously work super hard. You, you developed, you know, all the skill sets through, you know, quality coaching kind of like Michael Phelps, you know, he, he -hmm. also had some advantages too, right. Being double jointed and his height and, and things like that as well, but it's also not the means all. So that's also important to kind of talk about there. But something that I want to move to Mike is you competed at the 1984 Olympics. You won the silver medal in the men's four times 100 meter medley relay and the bronze medal in the 100 meter backstroke. Was there a specific moment from either of these races that you will never forget? And are there any stories that you would like to share with my listeners? Sure. Well, there's plenty of stories I could tell you about the Olympics, but I'll I'll leave it to mainly something. Although as an aside, um, the Olympics was, you know, it's a multi-sport event and the 84 games was the first games where they really commercialized it you know like they had the sponsorships it was in the states it was hollywood la you know hundred thousand people at the opening ceremonies the opening ceremonies was crazy um that was a time when a lot of the athletes still went to the games opening ceremonies because um it was it was a big deal uh and you weren't thinking so much about resting your legs although victor was swimming the next day so i don't think he went to the opening ceremonies so alex bauman was our flag bearer which at the time was huge because, you know, first of all, to carry the flag for your nation into the opening ceremonies, the Olympics games is huge, but to have a swimmer, to have a teammate do it was, was thrilling. And they had set it up where um, Sasha would just go in, do his thing, carry the flag. And then they, they scooted him out quickly. Cause I think he, I think he had 400 IM heats the next day as well. So it was an inspiration when you walk in and um, we were near the end, but when you walk into that, LA Coliseum and there's 100,000 people screaming. It, it was pretty overwhelming. It certainly gets seen the feels, you know, it's uh, it was pretty amazing. And we had the Frisbees. So we were throwing up Frisbees into the stands and we were the, the Americans, it was a really receptive crowd because, you know, we're neighbors and um, yeah, we got a really warm welcome. Um, it was a long event. So uh, yes, yeah, so I, was, I wasn't swimming right off the bat. And I, I don't know if it had a, a role to play, but I, I swam 200 back first and I, I did a terrible heat swim and I didn't make the final. Simple as that. And it was just one of those races where I was favored to win a medal and I didn't make finals. So if you don't make the finals. I, you're not in the hunt for a medal. And that was quite, um, it was devastating as an understatement because you think oh, four years of preparation done. And that's where you know, you have teammates and coaches that support you and, and um, try to lift you up. And no doubt Cliff was disappointed. I was disappointed. He could see that. And um, I, I think I even came second in the B final for that night. But Cam Henning went on to win a bronze medal. So props to him. I'm glad he was able to get a, a medal for Canada. But I was I was pretty dejected after that, after the whole, whole you know, after working so hard and you get a lot of self-doubt and self-reflection and you know, athletes can be their, their harshest critics. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to exceed and do well. And when we don't meet those expectations, we can be our harshest critics. Um, at the Olympics, um, Victor, I, I would always room with Victor. So Victor and I were all teammates at Waterloo, but we would always room together at inter- mostly at international competitions. So Victor and I were in the same um, room in residence at the, at the Olympics. And I remember before my hundred back heats, he, uh, he had already won a gold medal. And I remember him just sort of in his own way, just basically tossing or putting his gold medal just on the table beside my bed. Didn't say a word, but that was his way, Victor's way of saying, okay, like, listen, I got this gold medal. I know you got it in it and you to, you know, pr- produce a better result, produce the best result you can. And, uh, you know, no doubt seeing that medal was motivation being in a room with Victor, I mean, there's energy enough and that's motivation enough and he can get you psyched up. And so my hunter back, I did a better heat swim, but not a lot. I was, I was, I was, I seated eight. So as swimmers know, eight, eight get through to the final. I, I was uh, kind of a mediocre morning swim again, a few days later and just snuck in an eighth. So 
But then I got into a mindset and Cliff helped me with this as well. I was like, look, man, you got nothing to lose. It's you're in the final of the Olympics. You're in lane eight. No one's really expecting much of you, but you prepared for this. It's two lengths. What can you, what, what can possibly go wrong? Well, <laughs> possibly could go wrong. Um, and Sandy Goss is in the final as well. And part of my motivation to do well was whoever had, whoever was the fastest Canadian would be on that medley relay. So I really was trying to beat Sandy who ultimately also ended up on the relay swimming freestyle, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, so the hundred back, it was an outdoor pool. Um, the Olympics in LA uh, and up to Barcelona, I think were still outdoor pools. So one of the disadvantages swimming outdoors, if anyone who swims backstroke knows, there's no uh, markers on the ceiling to go by. You're going either your head's in a position where you got a, your sight set on something, uh, but you don't want to be like, um, bumper pool banging off the lane ropes because that slows you down so i could swim okay outside but the problem was late afternoon so the finals were starting and i do remember um our session was delayed by an hour for whatever reason so the sun was going down um so that helped because the sun was behind the 50 meter end and behind the scoreboard so you're, you're going off the gun goes off um i'm in lane eight you're swimming with the sun behind you and you, then you do your flip turn. And when you come up, normally the sun would be right in your eyes. But at that time of day, it was a bit lower. So it wasn't until about halfway through that length that the sun's in your eyes. But the, by then it's straight adrenaline. And I just was motoring it. And I just, I just kept powering away. I really, I knew Rick Carey was going to be winning that event. Um, but I knew I was competitive. And I really didn't know how, how I was finished, how I finished. But uh you know, you, you touch the ball at the end and you see my name third. And I was, you know, I was beyond thrilled, beyond excited. And it was just validation and relief more than anything then. Just complete relief that I produced a performance that was reflective of the training I'd done uh, and the best result I could get that day. So I was, it was pretty thrilling. And, and to be on a podium at the Olympic Games is, is also, you know, having your family there, your, your coach, your friends, the, the team supporting you. It was, it was a pretty thrilling event to be um, in the 100 back. And then, then the relay. So the relay was a few days later. And, um, you know, relays are different. I mean, anyone who's been on a relay knows it's a team event. And there's that energy and that shared excitement and motivation. And, again, if you're in a ready room with Victor Davis, you, you can't, but, <laughs> can't help but be influenced by that. Uh, so we were pretty, pretty stoked to, to do, uh, you know, a, a great result. Um, we knew it was highly unlikely we were going to beat the Americans, given that at the time, I believe they had the world record holder in each of the 100 disciplines. So Rick Carey, Steve Lundquist, um, Pablo Morales, and Rowdy Gaines, each, I think, were world record holders in the 100. So um, unless they got just DQ'd, we weren't going to beat them. But we were competitive against the Germans and the Australians. And for us, it was personal against the Australians because two years early at, earlier at the Commonwealth Games, um, in Brisbane, we had won the medley relay. And I, I think it was the last event of the games. And we were exhausted. This was October. We'd had world championships and, you know, we were just totally exhausted. And I think we were looking for the team championship. We won handily, like over a second, I think, over the Australians. But those of you who may follow swimming know that we were disqualified. And, you know, Victor kicked the chair, whatever. And, and they made a big deal about absolutely nothing. But we were disqualified. So, we were really wanting to sort of, I think, um, restore our role as, you know, one of the top medley relay teams in, in the world and, and, and show that we could produce a good performance. And, you know, it was neck and neck. I had a good hundred back. We all had good events and Sandy was our anchor and he was going up against, uh, I can't remember the name of the Australian swimmer, but it was stroke for stroke. Sandy out touched the Aussies by two one hundredths for the silver medal. So, that would that to get a silver medal uh, to beat the Aussies, but to get a silver medal at the Olympics and then to be on a podium, you know, with with Victor Davis by my side and those guys, it was um, that was that was a career highlight. I'll have to admit. That's awesome, Mike. Yeah, thanks for painting those two stories. You know, it was really fun to kind of hop in and hear like behind the scenes process. You know, with both of them and you know, in terms of that silver medal, like that time difference is so tight, you know, so close, right. So much could go right or wrong, you know, to, to get you that silver medal or that bronze. Right. It was cool to hear too, that that was a highlight. And also that you were able to be on that team, you know, because of your other performances, you know, during like the games. 
Something that I actually want to move to you, Mike, you also saw when you were at the games, you know, so many incredible, you know, athletes as well as swimmers, you know, what does it take to become a champion Olympic swimmer? As you kind of mentioned, you actually swam at one of them and that was Victor Davis. You know, I don't know how to, how to become an Olympic champion or how to be the best. I mean, I think hard work, setting goals for yourself, but being around people that that foster an environment of excellence. You know, Cliff, my swim coach, certainly fostered that with our club. But being around, you know, other top level athletes, I mean, there's lots around the world, but, you know, at the time, Canada had some of the best swimmers in the world. I mean, I would be at regular training camps and swim meets with Alex, I mean, and, and, and Victor. So we all sort of were from Ontario. So we all went to the same, you know, age group championships. So we all went to the same Brantford Invitational, which was for, took forever to get through heats and finals. You know, we all sort of went through the same process, harsh Canadian winters, you know, like we, we all had that same experience, but here were people that, you know, world record holders that still did the work day in and day out. So I think recognizing that being around these, 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 these champions, they were the same as, as the rest of us, you know, Victor, Alex, you know, um, and Tom, all these athletes, I mean, they were, they did the hard work. And so I think um, to be a champion, I think you, you put the hard work in, you set goals for yourself um, and you, you're in an environment. And what fostered for me, I think was the environment that Cliff set for us at the region of Waterloo swim club. I mean, he would, he knew how to bring out the best in every athlete. You know, he, he knew how to um, produce a team result by focusing on the individual. And that was Cliff's Cliff's magic. You know, he, he didn't, um, he had technical skills. I mean, he knew how to coach swimmers, but he also knew how to develop us as individuals and how to individualize our training. And, you know, Cliff, you know, kind of looks like um, success can be team success is like, uh, is like cooking a meal. Each individual ingredient brings something to the, the flavor of the, the final meal. And that's how we felt about teams. And, you know, Cliff really did provide this atmosphere at Waterloo where fostered excellence, but follow, also you know, looked at us as individuals and, and exposed us to all sorts of things outside of the pool, like music and art and crazy restaurants. Um, but he had that environment that really fostered excellence. And that's what, that's what brought out the best results in us. And I think that kind of environment is infectious. And when you've got people, you know, Victor's killing a set in this lane and Al Swanson is doing it in another lane, they're just working so hard. You know, if you're all having that shared pain and agony and, and work, um, that also can bring the best result uh, out of you as an individual. Appreciate you giving that answer, you know, about what you believe, you know, create an Olympic champion. I do think that once you do reach that really good level, you know, if even being an Olympian or being even like a world-class swimmer or even a high level swimmer or, or whatever terminology you want to use, a really good environment is definitely a key ingredient. You know, I had, I had Clifford Berry as a coach as well. And he was definitely someone that was very personable, right? And he was definitely someone that taught a lot of life lessons through sport, but not only through sport, outside of the sport as well. Something that I, I did want to question, you know, about, you know, your experience working with Cliff, how did he, you know, approach training to make sure that it improved you as an athlete, but also kept it fun and engaging? Because sometimes coaches could get so caught up in the ego getting in the way or becoming too serious. So how, how did he overcome that? Cliff, I mean, he, he really, unlike any other coach I'd ever had before, he, he really was innovative, interesting. He was, uh, he always made up workouts on, you know, when we were at a restaurant, he'd be writing something down on a napkin and just giggling away how hard it was going to be. But he just, he, he was always trying to create some punishing workouts that would bring out the best in all of us. And he did think out, he really did think outside of the box, not only with training in the water, but outside of the water. Like we would do running workouts. We would run up around the ring road at University of Waterloo on Saturday mornings before coming back and doing our three hour workout. In the, in the good weather, we'd play a soccer match at a public school down the road. We did yoga. I mean, we tried that for a year. It helped our flexibility. <laughs> uh, and he did like, he kind of did circuit training before that really was the thing. We would do, and it would be the morning workouts. We'd get there, you know, at 5.30 in the morning at Laurier in Waterloo. And it would involve running down the hallway. Um, and I remember this, because you go down a few steps and these crazy double doors that would bang shut. So you'd have to bang through a door, run down a hallway, go up some stairs, bang through another door, and then to the weight room where you do a, 
maybe a, a circuit. You do one set of like uh, push-ups, sit-ups, uh, bench press, uh, curls, uh, something. So it was punishing. And then you do another lap around, trying not to trip over the person in front of you. And it was exhausting. And that would be the morning workout, you know, training before we'd head in the water. We do the surgical tubing, you know, where you put around your, your waist and swim, you know, with resistance in the pool. Um, as you know, Cliff was a water, po- an excellent water polo player from two Olympics. So he knew something about water polo training. So he translated that to us for swimming, but we would do in the deep end, you know, those, uh, those treading water drills and trying to get your elbows above the water, then your nipples, then your belly button. Like it was punishing, uh, yeah, really, really punishing. But that was something outside of doing four 100s, I, uh, 10 100s IM or 10 200s IM. Like it would be something different. So that variety kept it interesting. We knew we were going to put the mileage in because that was the days when we didn't do as much race-based training, but we did a lot of uh, distance. But those different sports, those, uh, you know, the running, the, 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 the yoga, the, the, the weight training, all sort of, I think, helped make it a unique environment. And, you know, like we had, like every team, it's who's on that team as well. Like, you know, you got the jokesters, you got the people that just train like any, like can train beyond their capacity. And that being around that environment is helpful because all those different personalities make it a bit more interesting when you're, you're in middle of February, walking through the door at five 30 thinking, why the hell am I here? Like, what are we doing here? And there's someone who's going to make a joke. Someone's going to fart. Someone's going to do something that's just going to get you out of that headspace of, oh, dread and get into the the moment of training. And yeah, it it is a shared, shared misery, but a shared experience. And then there's also the shared rewards when your, your team does really well. And, you know, Cliff helped us, you know, produce some obviously great results at Waterloo, including a, a national team championship with, six guys in in Brantford I think in one year so um yeah it was it was it was the environment that Cliff created and so many people wanted to be part of that I mean he had swimmers come well Al came from Vancouver to join a whole bunch of swimmers came from Guelph drove would drive down every morning and night to swim with us which was about half an hour 45 minutes Cambridge so a lot of people would come to water specifically for the Clifford Berry experience that's awesome, Mike. It's definitely really impactful, you know, when you have such a great coach who knows how to work with a group of swimmers like that, right? Because swimming can get dull, right? And we always get chirped, you know, about looking at the black line and chasing walls, but there's actually so much more that you actually can do in a sport like swimming. Or you're also even thinking about when you spoke about when you were younger and you would have to have like the water on your head in a cup with one of your other coaches. I remember what stood out for me when I had Clifford Berry as a coach was also his innovation, but in terms of what technique, even like how many drills we did where that were so much different, like drills that I had never seen to really enhance your technique, but that was not common, you know? And then kind of like you said, also having challenging sets that, you know, focus maybe more on speed and then, but also having that time, which I think he actually allotted of, you know, making time. Okay. You know, they had a meet last weekend and we're going to play inner two water pool, you know, and, and doing things like that, which I think was huge because you have to also be able to dance with life. And I think Cliff was able to do that as a coach. He kind of knew when pushes swimmers to work hard. He also knew when, you know, to teach technique, but then at the same time, he also knew when to have fun. Yeah. Cliff, Cliff, Cliff could find fun in many things, you know, and that was one of his gifts is that, even stuff that we didn't find funny, he would find funny and just hearing Cliff laugh or giggle or find humor in something. um, That was, that was, that was a beautiful thing. And it was, yeah, it was inspiring at times because as I said, it could be misery being at the pool. And many times he was yelling or drilling down a workout. But, you know, when you have those moments of levity, when, when there's laughter and he could, you could tell a joke, it breaks that intensity uh, that was again one of his gifts as well, and and to hear Cliff laugh made anybody laugh if you ever heard him laugh before. Absolutely. So, Mike, I had mentioned before that you were recognized as like a captain for the men's team. How do you think that you earned that role? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think the the guys vote on somebody that they think might be upstanding. I don't know. Um, no, maybe nobody else wanted that role. I mean, it's it's kind of a figurehead role, but it also is a leadership role, and um, I think. Uh, I don't know. I think I might've earned it. I mean, 
I had a different personality than, than Victor or Alex. And, you know, I was quiet. I had this reputation of being kind of calm and quiet and respectful. And that was advantageous, but not always in, in my situation. And, but I, I think um, people looked up to me in terms of my, my performance and maybe my, my um, relative stability, my, the fact that I didn't get easily upset, maybe that was the reason why. And I think, who knows? I, I think you'd have to ask some of the other swimmers why they chose me. But I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's perhaps just the fact that I had a leadership quality that I didn't recognize at the time. And I would often lead cheers. I remember going, where were we? We were at Pan Ams, I think, in Caracas, Venezuela. And it was like hot, hot weather. And we were on this rickety school bus that would take us from the where we were staying to the, the pool. And it, everyone was kind of quiet and everyone was kind of like not saying much. And, uh, and then I thought, oh, this is kind of dull. So I just started saying, give me a C, something like that, something crazy like that. And I just got this spontaneous cheer going in the, in the school bus. So maybe that's what inspired them to make me the coach, uh, team captain, I don't know. But um, I was, I'm often a very enthusiastic cheer for the, the athletes on the team. So I would always be leading, cheer, often be leading cheers. It sounds like you had awesome, you know, team spirit. We're always supportive of all your teammates. So that's, that's definitely a, a quality that I heard there at the end that I think that probably stood out. So something that I want to move to is I know you have been involved, you know, with the Clifford Berry Follow Your Heart excellent project. And we actually spoke a lot about Cliff. For the benefit of my listeners, could you share what this is all about? Sure. Clifford, he had, a, you know, a unique coaching style and was very, authentic and genuine and honest about how he felt about things and in the last year or so before I think even before he became ill he was I think reflecting on on his ideas and principles about what makes a good coach and I think he has spent a lot of time thinking about that and recognized that he wanted to put that in writing and paper and he, he called it his manifesto um, which was entitled follow your heart and then basically what were the guiding principles to making an excellent coach and I think, you know, Cliff knew there's a technical side to coaching. I, I, I call it the art and science. There are also a lot of the coaches know the science, but it's the art. It's those soft skills around um, athlete development, coaching, um, um, how to support the individual. Those were principles that were key to his beliefs. And he really, he really did believe in the value of the individual. Um, and he felt that was kind of missing from sort of the curriculum for coaching. So he put his thoughts uh, in paper and then he was actually able to record them even when he was ill. Um, and there's a video out there, uh, follow your heart it's called. And it's basically the guiding principles uh, of, of his uh, beliefs about coaching and then really focusing on, focusing on coaching philosophy, character skills. And, um, you know, after he died, we wanted to keep his legacy alive because he had so much to offer and so much richness in what he said and in these guiding principles. So um, a group of us, um, Dean Bowles, um, Al Swanson, John Videka, myself, Susan and their daughter, Carlingberry, um, developed through a, an idea of trying to develop a sort of a fund called the Follow Your Health Heart Excellence Project through uh, Swim Ontario and Swim Canada to help recognize a coach or coaches who want to pursue, you know, excellence in coaching as a profession, like Cliff did, but also who um, have a, a love and passion for the sport, um, but really emphasizing, emphasizing, you know, the, the club development and grassroots, because that's Cliff's, that was, Cliff was passionate about. You can't get a world-class athlete without focusing at the very earliest exposures. And having a club system, a grassroots system that helps build up athletes uh, and helps them achieve their fullest potential by recognizing their unique, unique individual qualities, I think that's 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 the the, the nugget of of his his manifesto. So this fund has been developed, um, and so we were gathering donations and putting the money to a fund that will recognize uh, an educational development and a financial award for an athlete to apply. So anyone out there listening, uh, go to the Swim Canada web page and you'll find more information about this um, project. And yeah, we're trying to, across the country, trying to get coaches to show some interest and work on those skills that were so integral to Cliff's beliefs and his philosophy. 
That's awesome, Mike. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll definitely be sure to drop that link so then people know where to go to learn more about it. So Mike, something that I want to move to is what is one important lesson that you learned from your time as an Olympic athlete? I think probably one of the things I learned most is adversity, failure. And it sounds kind of crazy, but I think any athlete recalls their worst event, their worst race. And I had a few of those. And at the Olympics, you know, as I said, the 200 back, I, I, I did poorly. I, I didn't qualify for the, the final. And at the world two years earlier at the world championships in Ecuador, I was disqualified for missing a turn. One of those suicide turns, um, they're brutal. Those crossover turns where you have to kind of touch on your back. And I missed the wall with my hand. And I did my turn. I was just legitimately disqualified. Um, but it's those failures. It's, and I think that's what sort of helps a really great athlete is are those that can learn from their mistakes. And I think one of uh, one of Cliff's statements in the in in, in his le- his manifesto is you know like how we overcome our setbacks really will determine how far we go in life. And I think most athletes will recognize that it's the failures that they they may reflect more on. It's those missed opportunities or ways they can improve. You know, and and failures for me that were catastrophic, like not making the 200 backstroke final at the Olympics or being disqualified at the World Championships for for the same event. I mean, those are, uh, if you can pick yourself up, if you can learn from those mistakes and improve yourself and overcome those setbacks without letting them bring you down, I mean, that's going to, as Cliff said, will help define how far you go in life, that overcoming obstacles really helps define us. And I think that's one, one of the truisms that has stayed with me the most from, from Cliff and my experience with swimming. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, no, I definitely think that failure could be a your biggest teacher, you know, I definitely think that is the key life lesson there. So I appreciate that. So Mike, as you know, the purpose of this podcast is to inspire millions of people to achieve greatness and hence their overall personal well-being. So what is your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness, it, it kind of changes over time. I think, you know, my overall arching is, you know, someone who is constantly striving to be better. I think that's greatness. Someone who takes risks, who isn't afraid to take risks, um, works hard, um, and, and again, learns from mistakes and adversity. I think that's greatness. It's not necessarily setting a world record because not everyone gets that. And there are many great athletes and people out in the world who, who don't necessarily receive, don't reach the pinnacle of their discipline or sport or profession, but have those qualities. And to me, that's greatness. Um, and, and now that I've, I've sort of moved on from swimming, but into a career in healthcare and, and primary care and medicine, I mean, qualities I look for in in colleagues and individuals that work in the system, you know, qualities like I think that are essential, like empathy and, and, and passion and compassion and caring for others. I think those are qualities that help define greatness as well. Awesome, Mike. Well, I appreciate you for sharing that definition. Definitely do think that authenticity of being open to fail as well as improve, as well as someone that's always looking to strive to be better, that actually resonates with my definition of greatness. Um, And I definitely do think too, at the same time, and I I think you did a good job of pointing it out is it's not about, you know, always hitting that, that level of, you know, being like the champion. So I appreciate you for sharing that. And um, so Mike, who is a future guest that you would like to see on this show? Okay. uh, Future guests. Well, keeping in the swimming community, I mean, Mark Tewksbury never gets boring. Listen to him talk. So if you ever get uh, Marky Mark on the program, I think that would be a good good uh, interview. And, and Sasha Bauman, he's someone I still keep in contact, Alex Bauman, someone I keep in contact. And, you know, he uh, has had some pretty incredible life experiences. And um, he could, I think, would be an excellent guest. Um, he swears like a sailor. So you'd have to edit out half his comments, uh, although he does a pretty good interview. So I think he, you'd be safe. Your viewers would be safe with him. But he, he's a great interview as well. Cool, Mike. I'll uh, jot those names down and I'll, I'll keep them in mind. And if I have any of them on the show one day, I'll, I'll be sure to let you know first. Um, and uh, so Mike, where's like the best way if someone wants to, you know, connect with you, where's the best place to go? Oh boy. Um, I don't do social media. How about that? Um, how about they connect through you? <laughs> Cause literally like, I, I think I have an Instagram page. I think my daughter helped me. And the last one was a picture of my dog from about six years ago. So I, I, I honestly, I don't do social media. So if people want to reach out to me, they can go through you and we can connect. 
So Mike, uh, I just want to take this last moment here, you know, to really thank you for your time. Like you've been very generous, you know, at sharing some life lessons, some stories, and also as well as some wisdom. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you, you inviting me on and thinking that what I have to say is interesting. Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added value, please subscribe, leave a rating and make a review.